In the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give, will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called, us, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on, his, on us innocent blood, for, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked, him, picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right. Hey, you guys. How you doing? Good. It's great. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Um, we, uh, we're continuing this series in uh, the book of Jonah, and uh, you remember I kind of uh, pitched this whole thing as like a rescue, a rescue effort. We were battling uh, against what I call the veggie tales factor right, with this book, and so the veggie tales factor is the strange thing that children's media have done to the Bible in our culture, where they've made the stories very familiar to us, but they have at the same time watered them all down and turned them into bland moral lessons about how to be a nice person, something like that. And, uh, and so what this is a rescue effort, we're clearing the vegetation away. Uh, this covered over the book in our culture, and we're, uh, we're discovering what really a very disturbing and challenging book this is. And so kind of to recap, uh, last week it kind of helped us uh, see that this story is quite surprising in, in how it's told and that it's even in the Bible. It's the only book in the Bible that is a story about a prophet. It's not a book of the prophet's words. It's a story about a, a really horrible person, actually. And that story has a profound message to offer to God's people. And it's a unique kind of story um, that I characterize as, as comic or comic satire. So it's an ancient comic book, Saturday Night Live skit bundled up into one. And uh, Jonah, he has this, this representative character. He, he represents the covenant people of God. And he's a horrible, horrible, hypocritical, hateful person. <laughs> That's what Jonah is. And it, the, the storyteller just rakes him over the coal in front of our eyes. And especially chapter one, I mean, we're going to get a kick out of it. I mean, it's really quite funny how ridiculous he is. And everything's upside down in this book, and everything's crazy and extreme. The bad guys are actually the good guys, and the good guy is actually the bad guy. No one behaves according to their stereotype. And all of it is aimed at critiquing the worst uh, tendencies uh, that form in the hearts and minds of God's people, uh, of judgmentalism or pride, or as we're going to see uh, this week, spiritual apathy. Spiritual, uh, spiritual slumber. This chapter is all about either being asleep or being awake, essentially. And so uh, that's kind of what this uh, book is about. 
Um, so remember I said Surgeon General's Warning, Punch in the Gut, number two, this book packs a wallop. So get ready for the pain. <laughs> ready for the pain. Uh, and to kind of orient us into chapter one, part of it is these stories, for some of us, become so familiar that you have to try it. It's difficult to read the story like it's for the first time and to see it with new eyes or from a different perspective. So let me kind of give us an entry point with the story and then I'll kind of frame, help us frame what we're going to focus on in chapter one. Let me show you um, a picture of uh, uh, Google Maps. And uh, this uh, has nothing to do with Jonah, but everything to do with Jonah at the same time. So uh, what this is, you can see B maybe over here on the left, a little green dot. That is where you're sitting right now. This is Southeast Portland right here. Inner South, do you see Lad's Edition there on the left? Mm -hmm, just a few blocks that direction. So it's the X there. So if you ever tried to drive around in Lad's Edition and get horribly lost, anybody? Yeah, that's great. That's great. But then you discover Palio's at the center, which is wonderful. Anyway, it's a great coffee shop. So, so we're at B, and A um, is, uh, where, is where I live. And uh, in between the blue line there is my, is my daily bike commute. And so one of, one of my uh, kind of dreams, one of the things I wanted to do in moving back here to Portland, when we came to be a part of Door of Hope about a year and a half ago, was I wanted to enter the culture of bike commuting, because I just love it. I don't know, I love, and I love that Portland celebrates bike commuting. I think it's wonderful. Sometimes I cross um, the Hawthorne Bridge on Wednesdays to go uh, uh, meet someone every Wednesday, and like 8.45, and I'm like the 1500th bicycler across the bridge at 8.45, and I'm like, I love this city. This is the best city on the planet. Anyway, so, uh, you know, this is part of uh, living live the dream, so to speak. And so uh, I live off of uh, 51st and uh, Division. And so there you go. It's my daily, it's my daily bike commute. And I uh, make this at least once a day. There and back again. It's 2.3 miles, as you can see here. In 12 minutes, that's pretty, pretty accurate for their little calculator. I've done it in nine before. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> that's kind of pushing it, so 12, 12 minutes. So the longest stretch, you can see the longest stretch right there, kind of at the beginning, um, is along the Lincoln Street. It's one of these bike highways. Do you guys know about the bike highways in Portland? They're wonderful. They're so great. So what the city's done is, actually, it's great. So these bike highways, is multiple. They do them parallel between main arteries through the city, but it's off the of main drag, so it's more safe for bikes. So they put in the speed bumps that drivers hate, so like cars don't really like to go there. And they put huge pictures paint with big bicycles on the street, so you can't mistake where you are. You're on a bike highway. And they've uh, rigged all the stop signs so that it faces all the side streets, so you can just cruise. I mean, you can just go and never have to stop, except when you come to the main arteries, like 39th Cesar Chavez or something else. And so it's great. These are totally wonderful. What was also interesting, though, is so basically, you know, once I hit Lincoln, like, that's it. Like, I have to make one stop, and, and it's kind of a long stretch, and then I zigzag in Cross Hawthorne and over. Now, why am I showing this to you? Because something strange has started to happen. So I've been doing this uh, back and forth once a day, sometimes twice a day if we have evening, something going on here. And something has started to happen, and I just, uh, I thought I'd share it because I'm pretty sure this is a very common, very common experiment, experience. So maybe I might uh, cross 39th or I start zigzagging over towards Hawthorne. And somewhere along the way, I might kind of come to after Cross Hawthorne, so there's often traffic in the mornings or something, so I have to be aware. And sometimes I'll come, it's like I come to somewhere around 30th or something, and I'm just like, I have no memory of the last five minutes. <laughs> like, like, what, what just happened? Like, I, uh, I passed Stumptown already. I guess I did. I don't remember that, but I guess, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Here, have you ever done this? So maybe for you, this might be driving or whatever, and, uh, and you're driving, right? And uh, so you drive, it's your daily commute, your daily routine, your route, and you're just like, I have no memory of the last three minutes. It's like, what just happened? I just drove five miles and I don't even know what happened, you know? And so it's this weird experience. The human body and psyche is so amazing because we can do really sophisticated physical operations, but could be completely mentally checked out. You know what I'm saying? Isn't that amazing? I think it's really amazing. It's also scary at the same time because you're operating a motor vehicle, for goodness sake. <laughs> and I'm riding a bike. This is the most dangerous thing I do in a day. And you do too. And we're t checked out, you know, for half, of, for half of the drive. And so, of course, if a squirrel came or a cat or a person, you know, you would stop and be alert, I, I would hope. But it's bizarre. You're awake, but you're not awake. Because how many of you know exactly what I'm talking about here? This happens to us, especially in parts of our lives that become routine. 
and they become kind of dull or uninteresting to us. And so we just, for all intents and purposes, we just kind of check, check out. And it's not just when operating vehicles of, of any kind. It happens around the house, too. This has also happened, but <laughs> this is kind of a shameful story to tell. But I'm trying to work on it. So, we, so laundry is a very big part of my life right now. Two tiny little boys, cloth diapers. It's a lot of diapers to wash, you know. And so our laundry unit is actually out the back of uh, our apartment, and they have to go to a separate entrance to a little storage area down below. And so make that trip a lot. Just a lot. And sometimes I will like, come back, I'm like, coming in the back door, and I'll come, uh, once again, you come too. You're like, what just ha happened? Like, did I, did I turn the machine, did I turn the washing machine on? Did I put the clothes in? I was just, did I just go down there? I think I did. <laughs> I think I just went down there. And so I'll go down, and like, the soap dispenser will be open, and I didn't put any soap in, but I put the clothes in and turned it on or something, or, you know, and. So this is, it's not funny to my wife at all, but it's funny to me because it'll, it'll be like, hey, what the, what's up with the laundry? And I'll go down an hour later and no, no progress or whatever. So, or they're wet, they've been wet, but there's no soap on them. So this happens to us. You guys know what I'm talking I'm not alone here. I'm not alone. Okay. So, so this, is, this is not just how some of us live or drive or whatever. Like this, this goes much deeper. And it's precisely the kind of dynamic I think that Jonah chapter 1 is exposing for us is that we don't, we don't just, some of us like live perpetually in the state of disengagement, right? It's like 80% of your life, you know, and you're like, where did the last three months go? I don't, I don't know, whatever, and you keep on going. And that's how some of us feel about our lives. That's, that's how many of us are in our spiritual lives as well. And, and so maybe you've been a Christian for a while, and, you know, maybe at one point you had kind of a sense of alertness, a wakefulness. Uh, to your life and, and your connection with Jesus and, you know, you felt like the scripture spoke to you or, or prayer was a meaningful practice for you, but at some point that just kind of fizzled or whatever and you're just kind of cruising and totally, I'm totally say I'm a Christian, but you know the, the love, there's no love, <laughs> the love's gone or whatever, it's fizzled. And you're like, why did that happen? I don't know why that happened. And there's lots, of, there's lots of reasons for it. Sometimes it's seasons of life. You know, Eugene Peterson has this great line where he, he talks about the journey of following Jesus is like a long obedience in the same direction. There are a couple book clubs around here reading that book this summer. And that's exactly what it's like. And so not all of life is thrilling and exciting. And yes, of course, we get that. But, but it, there is something real that's been lost when I don't sense any kind of vitality in my connection with Jesus. And maybe some of you have never had that experience before. And, and so we might get there th through seasons of life. We might also end up in that place because of decisions that we've made. And there, are, there may be small decisions. Maybe they're bad, just unwise decisions. Maybe they're bad moral decisions. We know they're compromises, but, you know, how we justify these kinds of things. And then we find ourselves three months later down this road of decisions, and we're like, how did I get here? You know? Like, how did I, what happened to the last three months? And, like, how am I doing this? Where did that, how did this happen? You know? And it's not rocket science. It's, it's, you made, there's a slow process of decisions that landed you at a place of spiritual apathy, of being asleep at the wheel, and all of a sudden, things that you never thought you would be or thinking or doing, all of a sudden, this part of your life. Now, how did I get here? You're asleep at the wheel. And so Jonah chapter 1, this is an experience we all have. And Jonah chapter 1 is really, it's like a portrait of spiritual apathy. It's a portrait exploring why and how and what's happening to us when we're asleep at the wheels spiritually and the tragedy uh, uh, that, that that really is. And so, uh, you know, I don't know, it's not uplifting necessarily, but it's good for us to hear. It's like eating your vegetables or something like that, right? So it's Jonah chapter 1. So you guys with me with this image here? And sleep, the big image in Jonah chapter 1. So let's, let's dive in and we'll, we'll watch Jonah fall asleep at the wheel here. Uh, so back at the first sentence, we'll kind of cruise our, our way through it. So the word of the Lord that came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Two things. Remember when you see Lord in all capital letters uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, that's the English translators reminding you that in Hebrew what's there is not just the generic word God, but the divine name, personal name, Yahweh. It's the God, the covenant God of Israel. And it's going to be important as the story goes on. So the word of Yahweh that came to Jonas and of Amittai, remember what his name means? 
Anybody? Jonah means dove, son of faithfulness. <laughs> and you're supposed to laugh. You're supposed to laugh because he's uh, not an innocent dove and he's the least faithful character in this entire story. The word of Yahweh came to dove, son of faithfulness. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So God is surveying his world. He sees these, these horrible acts of oppression and injustice and violence arising out of the capital city of what empire? Nineveh? The Assyrian, Assyrian Empire. And uh, we'll explore more of that in a couple of weeks here when, we, when he actually goes to Nineveh in chapter 3. And so what uh, he, uh, God wants to send his messenger to confront and name the injustice that's happening. And what does God's messenger do? What does the innocent dove do? He runs away from Yahweh, headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship bound for that port after paying the fare. He went aboard, and he sailed for Tarshish. And again, why? Just to make sure you don't forget. Second time here. Why is he, why is he going here? To flee. To flee from Yahweh. We explored this last week. Now, just to kind of put a map up here, just to remind you of, the, of what's happening here. As he flees to Tarshish, so he's supposed to go east to Nineveh, Instead, he goes as far west as was humanly possible in the ancient world, right? So Tarshish was on the edge of the known world there before you get to the Atlantic. So he's supposed to chuckle. He's going as far as you could possibly go from Nineveh at that time. And so how does he, first, the first step he has to go to is to go south. Israel's in the northern hill country there of Israel. He has to go south to Joppa. That's a little detail that's, that's important. You'll see in a second here. So he goes south to Joppa, hops on a boat. To flee. Verse 4, let's pick it up. So then Yahweh, he sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. This is another little comic, comic image here. Um, the word threatened, or some of you have, the ship was about to break up. In Hebrew, the ship is animated. It's like a ca character in the story. So literally, it's, and the ship pondered breaking up into pieces. <laughs> it's like the ship is actually thinking, should I stay together? Should I stay apart? I don't know. The storm's pretty intense. <laughs> it's kind of, that's the idea here. You're supposed to, that's exactly, you're supposed to, to chuck out. English translations kind of covered up a little bit, but that's, the ship is, actually has a brain in, the, in, this, in this line. So the ship was pondering, breaking into pieces. And all the sailors, they were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. They even threw the cargo into the sea so they could lighten, lighten the ship. So, so Yahweh pursues his, his man with a severe mercy, right? So we might think, oh, here's the Old Testament God again throwing lightning bolts at people or whatever. And so no, remember the, the bigger picture. God wants to send Jonah to, to speak to the Ninevites so that he can bring them to repentance so they can find forgiveness and life. It's, it's God's mission to reach people and rescue them that's pursuing Jonah. Is his, it, is, this is a severe love. This is like the love of a parent chasing after their child who's going to bring their own ruin if someone doesn't intervene. That's the image here. This is not the volatile... That's a different God. It's not the God of the Bible, the volatile, perpetually ticked-off God who's just waiting to squash you. It's a different God. It's not the God of the Scriptures. And so this is the God of a fierce love who pursues his, his disobedient prophet. And so the sailors... Look at what the sailors are doing. I mean, are the sailors asleep? No, oh, they're wide awake, right? So they're yelling, right? You can just imagine they're throwing their own livelihood over the side. They're throwing the cargo. cargo. They've lost, it's a lost mission now. They've lost all their money because this is what they were carrying. And notice they're, they, they're awake and alert to what's happening here. What are they doing? They're afraid. They're throwing cargo. But what else are they doing? They're praying, aren't they? To whom? To whom are they praying? All kinds of different gods, right? Each to his own god. So, first of all, there's something, they are alert enough to recognize this isn't a normal storm, and there are divine powers at work here. Now, within their worldview, which is a polytheistic worldview, they believed in the existence of hundreds, thousands of gods over all the different realms of life, and so they do the shotgun approach to prayer, which is what you do if you're a polytheist, right? You, you shout out prayers to as many gods as you can. This, you know, you take that one, you take that one, you, okay, Jimmy, that one, Johnny, that one, you know, and hopefully we'll hit the right one, right? Because we don't know which one is angry with us, and that is the perpetual state you live in in a polytheistic worldview is you could offend any of the gods at any moment, and you don't know. They might 
throw a lightning bolt at you. That's very much a part of a polytheist worldview. And so they're like, well, okay, let's just call on all the gods and just see what happens then. But what's Jonah doing? So there's all this frenetic activity, calling, praying, cargo overboard, all afraid, yelling, and so on. And then contrast the prophet, man of God, what's he doing? He's asleep. Jonah, Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Now, there's a wordplay that's this kind of a little red thread through this first part of the chapter here. It's all about this language of going, Jonah going down, down, down. Where did he go to get to Joppa? What did it say? He went down. He went south here. And actually, you can just trace the language here in verse 3. He went down to Joppa. And then uh, some of our translations have he went aboard the ship. Literally, in Hebrew, it says he went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. Verse 5 he went below the deck into the depths of the ship, and there he went down, laid down in the deep. Can you see this here? So here's this image here of the prophet man of God. The, the pagan sailors, they are very alert to that there is a divine, mysterious power at work. And where is the religious man of God? He's slowly descending into a state of literal and spiritual slumber. And this is a very powerful portrait that the author develops here with this repetition of down, down, down. He's depicting Jonah's, he's depicting Jonah's sin here as something that has led him to this kind of numb, deadened, unaware state, asleep at the wheel, right? And, and so remember this kind of last week, but remember what's Jonah's basic failure here? What's his, his sin? The sin is that God has given him a call to go participate in God's story uh, of his grace reaching more and more kinds of people, confronting humans in their, in their oppression and injustice and wickedness and offering mercy and grace. And Jonah ran from that. And why did he run? Remember, he's not afraid. He hates Ninevites. That's why. And he knows that somehow Yahweh is going to find a way to bring them to repentance so that they will be forgiven. And Jonah thinks the world is a much better place with the Ninevites who are not forgiven and who get like, annihilated or something. And so Jonah thinks he knows better than God, and he acts accordingly. And so that's his failure, his, his sin. And so what, what this choice does is all of a sudden it begins to make him descend into this stupor. It's like his sin becomes like a sleep drug that makes him less. It's, it's this growing separation between him and God. And all of a sudden... He, he's in this scenario where there's like havoc and, and, you know, threats of danger and death or whatever, and he's just blissfully unaware of what's going on in his own life. This is, this is, this is a huge image here. It's ridiculous to us. We're like, who would fall asleep in the ship at sea and so on? And so all I can think of, it is true, um, like we have a little, you know, month and a half year old son, year old, a month and a half old son, and uh, when he does sleep, he really crashes. I mean, you could put a jackhammer next to his head, and he is out, you know. And so, yes, I suppose, you know, Jonah could fall asleep in its stormy and see, but it's, there's much more going on. This is an image of his sin and what's happening to him on the inside, spiritually. And so, who suffers as a result of Jonah's spiritual apathy? Who suffers? How's Jonah doing? Hey, he's great. He's sleeping like a baby, you know what I mean? Who's suffering as a result of his bad decisions? Everyone around him, right? The sailors, the sailors are. This is very insightful, I think. In other words, his, his sin, his selfishness, his, he thinks better, than, he knows better than God and everyone else, and he acts accordingly. This has led him into the state where he is just totally unaware of the people around him, even though he's bringing ruin on them. He's, Jonah has become this relational wrecking ball in the people's lives around him, and he's so unaware and dulled by his apathy that he just he's totally unself-aware that this is what's taking place. This is such a profound image, I think, of, of the nature of, of sin and its consequences in, in our lives. And, and this is only one story, one passage among many in the scriptures that highlight this. And we hear this as Westerners, and we're like, well, this is kind of weird. And it's because our, our view of morality 
is, is very uh, individual-centered. And so, you know, we were raised in this culture that essentially says, you know, your moral decisions and your moral compass, it's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure, but as long as you don't hurt anybody and everybody's consenting, then whatever. It's morally permissible, you know? And Jiminy Cricket, let your con conscience be your guide. You know? <laughs> That's kind of the way our culture operates here. And so what happens in Las Vegas? I mean, it stays there. What do you mean? It's, it's just it's your private decision, you know? It doesn't involve anybody else. No one else can say that's wrong for you, you know, because it's what you want to do. Nobody's hurt and so on. And so we have this, this very private, privatized, uh, individualized moral worldview, where if it's right for you, it's right for you, and so on. And, and what the scriptures do, and you don't ha even have to be religious to agree with this, what the scriptures do is, they, <laughs> in general one, it just exposes that. It's just utterly naive and simplistic. The Bible's account of human decisions and our moral decisions and how they affect other people is very profound and sophisticated. And so you, you have to respond to our Western culture and you have to say, you're, you're telling me that every moral decision that I make, like every moral decision Jonah's making in this story, it's a little brick, one little brick and a huge wall, right? And that wall is forming who you are as a person and your character. And you're telling me that a thousand little moral decisions isn't eventually going to form you into the kind of person who, if you're making a thousand bad moral decisions, small moral compromises, eventually you will reach the thousand first decision that will spill over the banks of your own life and ruin somebody else's. Are you, are you with me? Like, it's just utterly naive to think that my own moral decisions just affect me. That, that's so ridiculous. Our lives are so much more interconnected than that. And you can just see this in, in I think, the, the humor and the irony of when um, sex scandals break the, break the news. So, of course, you know, Portland government, we just had another one break the news. You guys follow this over the last few weeks. And American culture is so silly about this because we're the most, like, we're, we're bathed in sexual imagery and media more than any culture on the face of the planet. But we're also really prudish at the same time because when our leaders have these affairs or sex scandals, we're like, oh, I can't believe they would behave that way and they get totally lampooned in the public media and so on. I can't, does anyone behave? Oh, are you actually surprised that someone makes these kinds of choices? You know what I mean? Are we really surprised? Come, are you kidding me? How is, how is everyone not making these decisions based on how we all grow up? You know what I'm saying? And so what the Bible is essentially, and what Jonah 1 is, is trying to tell us, is that Jonah's decisions are not just his own decisions. And how does a person get to become a wrecking ball in the lives of other people? It's a thousand small compromises. And what was at first just a private decision between Jonah and his God, all of a sudden wreaks havoc in the lives of other people. And he's so checked out, he's so self-absorbed, he's not even aware that he's a, a, a force of ruin in other people's stories now. It's tragic. It's the tragedy of falling asleep at the wheel, spiritually and, and morally. And it only, it only gets more intense. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 6. So who has to go wake him up? The captain of this ship. This is a great, this is a great moment in the story. So the captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? <laughs> Get up. Call on your God. I mean, maybe your God will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Maybe Jonah's God will notice them. Do you get it? Does Jonah's God notice them? Very much so. <laughs> in fact, the whole reason they're in this mess is because Jonah's God already notices them, right? And, and who, this is ironic in so many ways, because he's a prophet. He has received and spoken the very word of Yahweh before. And yet, he has to be reminded to do something as simple as pray. By whom? By this, like, pagan polytheistic sailor, you know, who doesn't know Yahweh from anybody else. He's like, well, call in your God. We didn't, do, we didn't shotgun yours, so let's try your God, you know. Let's see what that. And so uh, that's the sailor's uh, kind of rebuke to the prophet, man of God. Let's keep going. Verse 7. So then the sailors said to each other, okay, prayer's not working, lighting the cargo's not working. Out. This guy's sleeping, he didn't, and that didn't work. So they said to each other, let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. 
So casting, it's like ancient dice rolling, and uh, in many cultures, and still today, even, and even in ancient Israelite culture, it was a way of discerning the will of the gods, and so they're like, we prayed, threw the cargo overboard, what do we do? I guess roll the dice, right? Maybe there's an unknown god, and he'll reveal uh, his ways to us, and ironically, it works, doesn't it? Because they cast the lots, and who wins the lottery? The lot fell on, wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it? It fell on Jonah. He, he won the lottery or lost it. Depends on your point of view. So they asked him. They said, okay, well, uh, tell us, tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? I mean, what, what kind of work do you do? Which has always struck me as funny that they ask him what kind of work he does. Like, what does that have to do with anything? What do you do for a living? I don't know. <laughs> they, they're so worked up. Here, again, this, this, this contrast, you could almost picture him as like yawning, like sleepy, like, what? What is, sorry, what's that? What? And they're like, they're all, they're so aware and alert to what's happening here. So who's responsible for this? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? Where is your country? From what people are you? And he gives a, a dry one-line answer, verse 9. He says, I'm a Hebrew. So he, he gives his ethnic identity, okay, answers one of their questions. And he says next, I'm a Hebrew. And I worship Yahweh, you know, the God of heaven. He's the one who made the sea and the dry land. I worship Yahweh, the God of heaven. He's the God who has power over the sea and who I'm running from on a boat. Come on. Come on. It's a good one. It's a good one, isn't it? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So... And there's a few other things. Some of your English translations uh, don't have, I worship Yahweh. They, what do they read? I fear Yahweh. And so this is a Hebrew turn of phrase. Um, it's familiar from uh, the book of Proverbs or wisdom literature, the fear of Yahweh. So it's about this deep uh, reverence and awe, but also like a really, a really healthy fear of someone that you're accountable to. Not because you think they're a jerk, but because you really, really respect them. So I had, my dad uh, was a, uh, a graphic designer and kind of car painter here in, in Southeast, and uh, he had a huge cabinet of, of Krylon spray paint all my years growing up. And I had a very healthy fear of that, even though, was, especially when I was 14, skateboarding, graffiti art, that whole thing is very popular. But I knew that my dad counted as Krylon cans. <laughs> right? I had a, and I had a very healthy fear, even though there was a whole world of graffiti art to be had from all of that. I, no, I didn't touch it because I had a fear. Not because I thought he was a jerk, because I knew that he loved me and that he was very aware of my behavior and I was accountable to him. Now, so get this. Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew, you know, one of the covenant people of God. And I fear Yahweh the God of heaven, the one who made the sea and the dry land. And you, the reader, are thinking what? No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't fear Yahweh. What is, what is this? What is, this is religious babble bullshine. That's what this is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> really, this is, this is the height of religious uh, hypocrisy. We're just supposed to be, I think we're supposed to like be, scandalized that he would even say something like this. What are you talking about? You don't fear Yahweh at all. And we can just see it right here. We can see that his words and his religious confession of faith are in deep contradiction to the choices that he's been making. And the author just leaves us with this. You know, it's, just, it's rich, isn't it? And, and the whole story up to this point, and the storyteller is just feeding us this, this horribly hateful hypocritical man, you know, and we're just taking it in. We're like, this is great. What a great story. I can't believe this guy. I can't believe anybody would actually behave this way. I'm sure I wouldn't. Oh, oh, dang it. <laughs> right? And there you go. You fell into the trap. So the, very, the very fact that you start to feel a little superior to Jonah, you're falling right into his trap. Because what he's doing with the story is just holding a mirror right up to your face. And he's saying, oh, really? Yeah, you've never had a contradiction between what you say you believe and how you actually live? Really? Really? You're really superior to Jonah. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. You must be asleep at the wheel if you really believe that about yourself. And the sailors can see the contradiction. Holy cow, look at verse 10. It gets even better. So this is funny. So he says, I'm a Hebrew and I fear Yahweh. And we're like, no, you don't. 
And what is the sailor's response when he says, I fear Yahweh? They were, they were terrified. <laughs> They're deeply afraid. And they asked, what have you done? And then the storyteller whispers in our ears here. He says, they knew he was running away from Yahweh because he had already told them that. Like, what? What does, what does that even mean? So he's, he's transporting us back. It's the little Wayne's World. It's a little, <laughs> he's transporting him back to, um, to the port, to the port, when he got onto the ship in the first place. Right? And this is really sophisticated, what he's getting at here. So there's a little scene on the port, and you can just imagine, if you've been through customs, immigration, that kind of thing, like reasons for travel, where are you headed? Oh, to Tarshish. You know? so where are you going? Business or pleasure? Well, neither really. You know, I guess I'm, I'm running from Yahweh, my God. You know? <laughs> and uh, whatever, you know, sanctified imagination, you know. So I've never heard that one, but uh, welcome aboard. All right, you paid your fare, so come on, come on aboard. <laughs> And so, because they're polytheists. They're like, Yahweh, I guess, is his personal God or something. I don't know. He's got an issue with his God. Whatever. He paid the fare. So get him, get him aboard. But now they realize, wait, you're, wait, you told us you're running from your God. And Yahweh is the God who has power over the sea. And you're running from him on our boat. <laughs> right? What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? And you guys, this is the, one of the most tragic ironies at this part of the story, is that there are, this happens multiple times in, in the Bible, is that it's often people who are completely outside the people of God who can see on full display the deep contradiction between what God's people say they believe and how they actually behave. And it, it's like the history of the church right, right before us here, right? And so here's what's actually even more fascinating, of course, is as you're going to see throughout the story, is is Jonah an imperfect witness to the God he says he believes in? Is he imperfect? Very imperfect, right? He does a very bad job of pointing to his God. Is God limited to how successful Jonah is as as a perfect witness to God? Just keep that in the back of your mind. Is God limited to using this Jonah in bringing people to himself. Just keep, that's a, that's a, you can, that one's for free. <laughs> All right? Just tuck that away back there. So he, he goes on, this, what do you think that you're doing? So the sea gets rougher and rougher, verse 11. And they asked him, well, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Well, I, I pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied. It will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Now, this is, br- this is brilliant. So it, there's two ways you could take his words. And you, no one saw this coming. So what should we do? Kill me. <laughs> Throw me over. Kill me. Whoa, okay, that's interesting response. So how, how are we supposed to take that? Well, it could be that he's had a real change of heart. This is the first kind of awareness of others. I'm like, oh my gosh, what have I done to other people? Oh, no, no. Like what? Okay, I made my choice. I got to get what's coming to me. Pay the time to pay the piper. That could be what he means by that. He could also, and if you read commentaries, people are back and forth on this. He could also have actually be running even further from God right now. What would be the surest way that he could escape from having to go to Nineveh? Well, die. Die. And this would not be out of character because he's going to request to die again in chapter 4 because he'd rather die than live and obey a God like, live with and obey a God like Yahweh. Could it be that he's actually further even hardening his heart? He would rather die than obey God and acknowledge what's, what's really going on here. The storyteller doesn't make it clear. He just kind of leaves it there. And I think this is actually intentional on the storyteller's part because what it, it gets you to, to really look deep into human motives and, and why we do the things that we do. And even when we confess and are aware of the wrong that we've done, are we really fully aware of like, how screwed up we are? And like, I don't even understand the motives of my own heart sometimes, much less somebody else's, you know what I mean? So he's bringing us into this here. We know what the sailors think about. They think this is a horrible idea. Look at verse 13. The men were like, no way. So they did their best to row back to land. But they couldn't because the sea grew even more wild than before. If, if, however, this is my opinion, if Jonah really 
was having a change of heart here. Why didn't he just say, okay, I give up, God. I'll just go back to Nineveh now. He just tossed me over. And they're like, bad idea. No, that's bad. And they, but they can't go back. So something's happening with Jonah that's making it impossible for them to go back. Verse 14, then they cried out to whom? Look at, look at this. This is great. Who are they crying out? The sailors cried out to whom? Verse 5, when the storm first hit, who are they crying out to? All the different gods. Now they've had this experience, and they have come to a place, as we're going to see, where they recognize that there is only one God who's, who has power over sea and land, the most powerful God, Who's the only God who can rescue us now? It's Yahweh. It's Yahweh. Something has changed inside of these sailors. Now, they are recognizing Yahweh. And this is ironic. This is the first prayer offered to Yahweh in the chapter. And who does it not come from? <laughs> Jonah, who does it come from? These pagan sailors, whatever. And they're cluing into what's, what's going on here. So they cried out to Yahweh, please, Yahweh, I, you know, don't hold us Oh, don't let us die for taking this man's life. We don't want to. It's his idea. <laughs> don't hold us accountable for killing this innocent man. I mean, he hasn't done anything wrong against us. So you, Lord, you've done as you please. I mean, you can just see. They're just like, we don't know. Yahweh, you're powerful, and you can save us. So I guess we're going to do this, even though we don't want to. They took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared him. Who only says he fears Yahweh? Jonah. Who actually fears Yahweh? The pagan, the pagan sailors, right? And they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made, and made vows to him. This is astounding. This is astounding. Because sacrifice, if you're burning up like two whole goats or a cow, this requires a very large fire, Yes. So you need a big altar and a big, huge fire. Are you going to make a fire that size on the deck of your wooden ship? <laughs> no, no. No. So implied here, they get back to land. They find a Yahweh temple, where this, and everything's dedicated to Yahweh here. They offer sacrifices. They make vows to him. They become dedicated followers of Yahweh from here on out. And so something has happened inside these sailors, despite the very imperfect hypocritical behavior of God's people in the story, God is still capable of bringing people to himself. You guys with me here? But is that license for us to go behave like Jonah? That would be the most idiotic thing you could get from the story. <laughs> so because not only will it go badly, it's going to go badly for you. Like it's just not going to go well for you, much less for other people as you become a wrecking ball in their lives because you're so tuned out. And so here's the greatest tragedy, I think, of Jonah chapter 1, is that you have, you have God's own prophet, his own covenant man. And he's so tuned out and apathetic and asleep because of his sin, he can't, he's not even aware to the fact that all these other people around him are totally alert and alive and God's doing amazing things right around him and he's, he can't even see it. He's so turned in on himself in his own little deal. And so he misses being a part of this conversion of the sailors around him because all he's thinking about is, is himself. He's just totally, totally tuned out. And I can't, I can't think of a more accurate depiction of, of what spiritual apathy and spiritual slumber looks like for us. And so it's just this, it's this basic idea. Somehow, like, American Christianity has fostered this system where, you know, you got the grace card, and so you're covered there for the thing that happens after you die, so that's done, cool. And so, whatever, kind of grin and bear it, you know, or tr try and keep your nose clean, but you can always play the grace card and so on, have a good weekend, and then come back to church again. Or something. You know, like that, we've fo it's fostered this, this kind of thing, and so what you end up with is a whole culture full of people like Jonah. And they can tell you all kinds of theology, oh, I fear Yahweh, do you know he made the land and the sea? Do you know he's the God of heaven? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, but yet yeah, there's this deep contradiction between what he says and what he actually lives and the choices he makes. And everybody can see it but him. There you go. There you go. And so it's this, it's this tragedy because not only does he miss out on how God wants to use him in the lives of these other people, he's, he's, he's like withering as a human being. He's totally drawn in on himself. And so it, it, it begs the question, like, where's the resolution here? Like, how does, is Jonah going to wake up? Does he ever wake up? 
Look at the next line. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow up Jonah. Now just stop right there. If Jonah was a one-chapter book and it ended right there, is this a happy ending? No, this would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? This would be a, like a classic like Greek tragedy play or something. You have the protagonist and he's a horrible, like goes down in flames, dies, tragedy, but, and maybe some other people have goodness happen in their lives or whatever. Utter tragedy. You're not supposed to read this line, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah and go, hooray. <laughs> like, it's not a good thing when you get swallowed by a huge fish. You die. That's what happens. And so we think Jonah in the belly of the fish, three days, three nights, slow digestion, just like the Sarlacc pit in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> slow digestion over thousands of years, right? That's good. It's good. It's a good geek line for you. <laughs> That's the idea. We're supposed to go like, no, 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 no. But then all of a sudden, the surprise, what? From inside of the fish. And then all of a sudden, we'll get to next week, Jonah all of a sudden is very awake and very alive and alert to, to Yahweh uh, after this experience. You're like, what? He's composing intricate Hebrew poetry from the oxygen-less environment of a fish's stomach. Like, okay, that's bizarre. We'll talk about that next week. But I want you to see the image here. See the image here. Jonah, he's, he can't go any further to the bottom, literally. He's going to depict himself as going to the roots of the mountains in the sea. And a huge fish gobbles him up. And you think it's over. It's over. This guy is he's wiped off the face of the earth. And that may be true if we were dealing with any other god but Yahweh, the maker of the sea and the dry land. And so in this story, and just think about the arc of the story right now, Jonah, he was just blind, asleep, wrecking ball, can't even own up to it, all the way to the very end, he hits bottom, and Yahweh provides this instrument of what seems like death to swallow him up. But right there, in this moment of just hands up, can't go any deeper, like he's utterly powerless, that moment of death becomes the moment of his new birth. And the moment where God actually strangely uses this instrument of death as this now bizarre vehicle of grace and, and to give him life and a second chance. Do you smell the gospel here? <laughs> Do you smell it? Can you see now why Jesus appealed to just this moment in the story to describe himself? In Matthew chapter 12, the Jewish leaders come up to him like, who do you think you are? You think you're the Messiah? Give us a sign. And Jesus says, I'm not going to give you any sign except the sign of Jonah. And you're like, what? It's so weird. Why does he say that? And then he says, just like Jonah was swallowed up by the fish, you know, three days, three nights. So I will be in the grave three days, three nights. I'm going to die. And you're like, what? It's weird. So, so Jesus sees this, this moment of God enveloping his covenant people in death because of their sin and rebellion, the moment they can't go any further into rebellion, and he meets them right there in their brokenness, and as we're going to see next week, repentance. And all of a sudden, this moment of death is turned into new life, a chance at new life. And Jesus says, yeah, that's like what I'm going to do. So Jesus lives as like the anti-type. Of, he is the very opposite of Jonah. He is utterly and completely other-centered, self-giving, and aware of other people and their well-being perpetually, 24-7. He's just on. And so he's, he's God become human to be the kind of human that you and I can only dream of becoming. And, he, and, and what do we do with him? <laughs> we murder him, right, collectively. As, as, a, as a human race, we are all responsible for why this world is the way that it is. And Jesus died for this world because it is the way that it is. And so Jesus absorbs into himself all of our sin and our apathy and the ruin that it causes in our world. And he, he actually takes the hit for us. But somehow, strangely, the death of Jesus becomes something that gets turned upside down into this vehicle of life. And in his love, God conquers our sin. He conquers death itself. And in Jesus' resurrection from the grave, as we grab onto him in faith, we, we actually can experience a second chance at being human beings a new and different kind of life. And the life that's given to Jonah after this experience, he's on borrowed, borrowed life now. <laughs> it's not his life to live anymore. He's living on, on pure grace from this point out. And so it seems to me this, like how do you wake up spiritually? 
I don't know. Like, I could write a book, Three Steps to Wake Up Spiritually, you know, and I could have got on Oprah or something like that. You know, my time's passed now, whatever. And, but there's a hundred of those books out there. And, and some of you bought those books, and they don't work. And they don't work because how do you, what do you have to do to wake yourself up spiritually? Like, slap yourself away. Something, how do you do that? What does Jonah do to wake up spiritually? You see, that's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. Jonah doesn't do anything. Something is done to him. All he does is sit at the bottom of his character, the thousand decisions that have made him this hypocritical, hateful man, and he just throws up his hands and is like, you know, uncle, I give up. I give up. And right at this moment where he he feels like he's meeting his own death, that becomes the place where God meets him with his grace and gives him a second chance at life. This is good news for people like us. Amen? And so Jonah doesn't do anything to wake up. God's grace happens to him, and he becomes awake to it for the very first time. And so I don't, I'm not in the business of trying to like get you to be good religious people or something, right? So I, don't, I would have a much nicer suit and much taller hair if I was trying to do that, right? I mean, that's not what this is about. We're a community of people that I don't even feel like authorized to give this message because, I mean, I was deeply convicted studying Jonah 1 this week. I'm a, I'm a total hypocrite. Like, I don't have any right to give this message to anybody else. But here's the thing, neither do you. And so, like, what are we going to do? You know, somebody's got to read Jonah 1 aloud. So, so here I am. And so, whatever. Like, we, we are a community of people that are trying to wake up to the fact that God has done something for us. And I don't know how to wake you up. I don't know how to wake myself up except to, to wake up to the fact that I'm helpless. That's all I have to do. And that, we can work with that. <laughs> and that's precisely where Jonah lands. He just throws his hands up. And so, man, I don't know where you're at tonight. You know, I imagine many of us, we're seeing ourselves in different moments of the story, the contradiction between what we say and what we actually do, the way that we we. We may be aware of it or not aware of it, that we are the wrecking balls in the lives of other people around us. And we may be totally ignorant of, of that fact. I bet your best friends aren't ignorant of that fact, <laughs> but you might be. And so this is what it means, is just coming, coming to Jesus and saying, I'm asleep, I'm drowsy, I don't know what to do, but I know I'm screwed up. And we can work with that. <laughs> Jesus can work with that. And so I just encourage you in the time that remains every week, you know, we have this, this extended time at the end to turn on the AC unit <laughs> and, uh, and uh, to reflect for the poetry of the music and to meet Jesus in the bread, in the cup. And, you know, don't let the bread and the cup become verse 9. Oh, the broken body, you know, like I worship Yahweh. And so, like, no, <laughs> wake up to what's happening there. This is a moment you have in, in the presence of God's gathered people to meet Jesus and remember these tactile experiences of what Jesus has, he's broken body for you, his shed blood for you. And if you need to turn to the community for prayer, you know, uh, fill out a prayer card and drop it in the box. Come to the prayer team. This is a time for us to, to be real and to not just spout religious bull honky or whatever. So did you like my use of bullshine earlier? <laughs> so you thought I was going to say it. And I was like, no, I'm not going to say it. But uh, that's good. Anyway, so that's not what this is about. And so wherever that means to you, I have no idea. I do believe God's spirit can show you what it means to you. And so let's just humble ourselves uh, and throw up our hands and uh, wake up to the mercy and grace that's available to us in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let me close this with a word of prayer.